My name is Rachel Bloom with the CSU Alumni Association, and we're stoked that you decided to join us for our gardening series with CSU Extension. You are here today for our pollinators webinar. This is actually the last event in our gardening series. So if you've been to multiple, thank you so much for joining these. Uh, I hope it's inspired you to get outside this summer and plant something green. Uh, and recordings are actually available on our YouTube channel as well. If you wanna go ahead and go to the next slide as well, Lisa. We also want to give a big special thank you to our series sponsor, Fossil Creek Nursery, and a big shout out to our event sponsor, Outpost Sunsport. I'll be including their websites in the chat as well. I want to thank all of you for participating today, and please feel free to put in the chat where you're watching from and what year you graduated. If you click all panelists and attendees, then everyone can see your message. But wherever you may be tuning in from, we're so glad that you're here. This is a webinar, so just so you know, if you're eating lunch right now, we can't see you or hear you, but please use the chat feature or the Q&A feature to communicate with us throughout the presentation today. We'll have some time at the very end as well for questions if you have them for Lisa. So if we wanna go to the next slide, many of our attendees are CSU Alumni Association members. So thank you so much for your membership. It makes our programming possible. I'll be including more information about membership in the chat momentarily. We also have CSU Day of Giving coming up on May 6th and 7th. And during this 24 hour online giving event, CSU alumni, students, friends, faculty, and staff will come together to support student success, faculty research, and critical resources that will help encourage a brighter tomorrow. It's the perfect time to take your RAM pride to the next level with a gift to the area that is most meaningful to you. We can go ahead and move to the next slide as well. I would be remiss not to give a wonderful shout out to CSU Extension's Master Gardener program, which established Grow and Give in 2020 as a modern victory garden project in response to heightened levels of food insecurity resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. But now the Grow and Give program continues to address food insecurity in Colorado by connecting backyard and community gardens to food donation sites across the state. The program provides resources to help you both grow and give part of your harvest. So if you have questions about that, Lisa can be a great resource for you and we'll include some information in the chat as well. So I also will include in the chat some other helpful articles, upcoming virtual events and all of those good things. And then at the very end, I'll include a survey if you're interested in letting us know how the series was for you. And if you have event ideas as well, we love to hear topics. So you're not here to hear from me though. You're here to hear from our wonderful extension agent, Lisa Mason. I'm super excited to have her take it away and teach us a little bit more about pollinators. Lisa, thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm super stoked to be here. Uh, I graduated from CSU twice with my uh, bachelor's degree and master's degree. Um, I've also worked to, uh, for CSU since I graduated and that is how I got interested in entomology, the study of insects. And I'll share a quick story with how I got to where I am. Uh, I had just graduated with my forestry degree in 2008, which was the height of the mountain pine beetle epidemic in Colorado, uh, where we lost 3 million acres of trees in our mountains. And so I was got a job with the Colorado State Forest Service, also a part of, of CSU. And I was teaching people about the mountain pine beetle epidemic and what to do about it. And, you know, the mountain pine beetle epidemic, it was devastating to us. We lost so many green trees. But what the, the interesting part about it was, was that was a native insect doing what it was supposed to do. They only killed really old, stressed out trees. And we had been suppressing fires for so long our forests were pretty stressed out. And so learning about how the forest is doing what it's supposed to, that little tiny beetle, the size of a grain of rice, is doing what it was supposed to do, but it had such huge impacts on, on people in Colorado, on tourism, on our wood products industry. Uh, you know, the, the impacts were, were pretty enormous. So that got me interested in insects because they impact humans in, in our world so much and most of the time we don't even realize it. So let's go ahead and get started. The more I started learning about insects, the more I realized pollinators, we depend on pollinators. And that's why we're here today. 
So uh, when I went, I pursued my master's in entomology and studied native bees and citizen science, which I will touch on in a little bit. And, and that, that brought me to where I am today. I work for CSU Extension now as the horticulture agent in Arapahoe County. So today we're gonna to talk about why pollinators are important uh, and who they are. We're also gonna to touch on wasps because there's a lot of confusion between wasps and bees and other pollinators. And then we're gonna to touch briefly on beekeeping and is that right for you? Uh, and then we're gonna go into pollinator habitat and what you can do to support pollinators in your backyard. So thinking about big picture, why, why do we even care about insects? Well, E.O. Wilson, a famous biologist and naturalist, estimated that without insects, we would only be able to survive maybe a few months. Uh, they're that critical to, to our world. Uh, and you know, it actually goes beyond just pollinators too. And, and a great example that I always like to use are dung beetles. Dung beetles are a group of insects that are responsible for their decomposers. They, they recycle dung back into the soil. Without decomposing insects like dung beetles, we would still have bison patties from when bison roamed the West. And, and that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Insects provide pest control uh, they provide control of invasive species. Uh, we get products from insects like honey and silk. Uh, in many countries, insects are a vital protein source, a, a food source. Um, not so much here in the United States, but, but insects, the benefits just go on and on. But we know insects, pollinators included, are declining. Uh, urbanization and habitat loss is one of the major reasons. And so that is one thing that's Sort of a silver lining with, with pollinator conservation is everybody can help with pollinator conservation because anyone, almost anyone can plant flowers and, and support pollinators that way. So why do we care? Why are they important to us? Well, pollinators are responsible for about pollinating one third of the world's crops. So that's about one in every three bites of food that you eat. Most of the time, it's our new most nutritious, uh, like fruits, veg bleh, fruits, vegetables, and nuts. But they're also responsible for, for other uh, food industries as well, like our meat and dairy industries, because cattle often feed on clover and alfalfa, and clover and alfalfa are pollinated by bees. So everything, everything is all connected. And then when we think about it from an ecosystem approach, about 75% of all plants in our world need pollinators to reproduce. And it goes beyond just the honeybee. So, so everyone's most familiar with the honeybee. That's one species of bee we have, uh, but we have a lot of specialist relationships. And, and I'll highlight a couple of these, like the yucca plants and the yucca moths. Um, there are species of yucca moth that pollinate the yucca plant and one cannot survive without the other. So you lose the yucca moth, we don't have yucca plants. Uh, they're very specialized in, in pollinating yuccas. Squash bees are another great example. Uh, if you appreciate pumpkin in squash, you definitely have to thank the squash bees. Uh, you plant them and they will come. They're by far the most efficient pollinators of pumpkins and squash. They're out in the early morning hours. I suggest you go look at the big yellow flowers and, and watch those bees visiting the flowers um, buzzing around very quickly. Uh, honeybees will visit squash flowers, but you know, squash bees already have the pollination done by the, honey, by the time the honeybees even wake up. Um, cactus bees, we have some bees that specialize on cactus plants and bumblebees. Bumblebees are responsible for something called buzz pollination. So when they land on a tomato plant, they have a special vibration that releases the pollen from the plant. And so they're great at uh, pollinating any of our veggies in the nightshade family, like tomatoes and peppers. Uh, they also can pollinate blueberries. And so what is pollination? Pollination is basically facilitating plant reproduction. Many plants are unable to reproduce without the assist assistance of a pollinator. So what happens is the bee visits the plants and the bees visiting for, for pollen and nectar, uh, they don't realize the important job they're doing, uh, but they visit the bright colored flowers for the pollen and nectar 
And in the process, pollen grains are deposited on their hairy bodies. They, they stick to the hairs. And then the bee visits another flower. And in that process, transfers those pollen grains to the other flower and thus facilitating plant reproduction. This is a very high level of, of pollination, but it gives you the, the basics of what pollinators do. This is what happens when we don't have pollinators. Uh, we don't get the, the ripe fruits and veggies uh, that we are used to. And so I'm gonna dive into a lot of bee content, but I do want to give a shout out to all our non-bee pollinators. So let's start with hummingbirds. Uh, a lot of birds are pollinators. In Colorado, we have hummingbirds that are our bird pollinators. You can see this female, she's got some pollen on her head there. Uh, hummingbirds are common, uh, especially along the Front Range and, and on the, the West Slope. Uh, we have about four species that you're likely to see. They are here, they have migrated back. So if you haven't put out your hummingbird feeder, now is the time to get it out. Uh, they are generally attracted to red flowers and those red flowers need to have a long funnel shaped uh, shape to them so the, the hummingbirds can access the nectar. Wasps, now we have, wasps are one of the most diverse group of insects that we have. Uh, most of them are not pollinators because they don't have the hairs on their bodies, but there are exceptions to every rule. So here in this photo is an example of pollen wasps that specifically feed on pollen and nectar. And you'll see pollen wasps uh, hanging out of penstemon flowers here in Colorado. Flies, we have a variety of flies that will visit flowers. And I'm gonna touch on that here in a little bit. Um, flies that visit flowers often have two benefits. So not only can they be pollinators, but the, the larval form of flies will feed on pest insects like aphids and, and other things that we don't want in our gardens. So we love our flower visiting flies. Butterflies. Butterflies are a lovely visitor uh, to, to in your garden. We have about 250 species of butterflies here in Colorado. The key to attracting butterflies to your landscape is to plant the pollinator host plant, or I'm sorry, the caterpillar host plant. So they'll visit nectar flowers and pollinator friendly flowers. But look at, um, we have a great fact sheet that we'll email out to everyone afterwards. And it has a table of the species and the caterpillar host plant. So that way the female can lay eggs on that plant and, and the caterpillars have a food source. Um, and in the picture here, uh, that's a monarch butterfly. So monarchs, uh, the caterpillars feed on milkweed. Beetles can also be pollinators. We see beetles visiting flowers uh, towards the end of the season, a lot on like rabbit brush and goldenrod. Um, beetles are going for, for food on those plants as well. Moths are also pollinators or can be pollinators. Here's my favorite pollinating moth in Colorado. That is called the white lined sphinx moth. And it's, it has a really long tongue. So it's gonna visit flowers that have long spurs. See those long spurs on the end of the columbine there? Um, so the white lined sphinx moth looks a little bit like a hummingbird in flight. You'll see them in the early evenings a lot of times. Uh, they're often confused with the tomato hornworm. They are, they're related, but they are totally separate insects. Uh, the white line sphinx moth does not harm your tomato plants at all. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then bats. Now bats are great pollinators. Here in Colorado, we have 18 species, uh, but they feed on insects here. So they provide us very valuable mosquito and pest control in our landscapes. Uh, but if you go a little bit further south where the climate is warmer and you appreciate a good margarita, um, you have bats to thank for that because bats pollinate agave flowers that, and agave flowers are what they use to make tequila. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about bees. We have a huge amount of bee diversity in our world, over 20,000 species. Here in Colorado, we have over 900 species. Colorado has a lot of bee diversity. We have a lot of different ecosystems and elevations. We also have done a lot of research on the bee diversity in Colorado. Uh, in other states uh, where they have lower bee diversity, there may not have been 
as much research done because these are hard to study and, and it takes a lot to really understand uh, the full extent of bee diversity. So let's talk about the life cycles of bees. And, and that really helps us um, know how to support bees in our landscapes, how we can provide habitat for them. So we're gonna talk about three different life cycles. So our first life cycle we're probably most familiar with. These are our used social bees. So this is our honeybee. Now the honeybee is the only used social bee we have in Colorado. Honeybees are actually a non-native species. So they were introduced back in the 1600s and we manage and de they're domesticated. Um, they're actually classified as livestock under the Department of Agriculture. And so what that means for us is honeybees are not gonna go extinct. Um, they, you know, we manage them, we breed them, you can buy them. Um, they are not gonna go extinct. However, honeybees have their own challenges, which I'll touch on in a little bit. Um, and you social bees in general, they have three different characteristics. So they, they honeybees live in man-made hives um, and they, they have a very complex social structure. So they have overlapping generations. So you've got, you've got day-old bees, you've got foragers that are out foraging on, on flowers, you've got the queen that might be a couple years old. Um, you've got different generations all at the same time within the hive. You also have the reproductive division of labor, which means the queen, she is the only one that lays eggs and the rest of the colony's job, their job is to protect that queen and keep her safe because she is key to the survival of the colony. And then cooperative brood care. Once bees, uh, honeybees reach a certain number of days old, uh, they are, their job is to tend to the baby bees. They feed them and care for them and rear them to become adult bees. So that's our social bees. So that's one end of the spectrum. And then you go all the way to the other end of the spectrum. We have our solitary bees. This is 90% of our bees are solitary. So solitary bees have a very different life cycle. It only lasts one year and they don't interact with any other bees. There's no queen, nothing like that. So solitary bees, the female will forage for pollen and nectar. And then she's gonna find a nest site, usually underground or in a cavity. And she's gonna pack that pollen and nectar into a tight ball. And she deposits one egg um, on the, the bee bread is what we call it. So once she does that, she seals up her nest cell and then she's gonna do it again. And so she'll keep collecting that pollen and nectar and depositing one egg on the bee bread and sealing up that nest cell. So those little baby bees are gonna overwinter like that. And then they will go through full metamorphosis. And then the following year, they will emerge from underground or from their cavity. So very different life cycle and we can help support our solitary bees. Of all of our solitary bees, 70% nest underground, 30% nest in cavities. So here's a picture of some underground bee nests. Most people, when they walk by that, they're gonna assume, um, you know, ants probably live there. Well, I would suggest watching those holes and see if you see any uh, additional critters coming out. Uh, there might be other insects nesting underground. A lot of other bees will nest in cavities, which is where our bee hotels come into play. And we'll talk about bee hotels. Um, and some bees actually will excavate the inside of a twig. Um, or nest in a hollow twig. Um, those are some of our cavity nesting bees. So here's a picture of the metamorphosis process. We've got larva, the bee bread, and then we've got a pupa before they become an adult bee. Okay, so we talked about social bees and solitary bees. Right in the middle, we have our bumblebees and they have a life cycle that we call primitively eusocial. So bumblebees share characteristics of both solitary and social bees. They have a queen and I, in my personal opinion, queens are the most hardy bees out there. They actually hibernate as an adult. They'll find a, a cozy spot for winter, maybe underground or in a thick pile of leaves and they're gonna hibernate as an adult. Spring is here, they're about to emerge. She'll forage on some pollen and nectar and then she's gonna find an empty cavity perhaps an old mouse nest, 
uh, maybe a pile of logs, uh, and she's going to start building her colony. So she'll lay a few generations of female worker bees that will tend to the colony. About midsummer, she's going to lay some eggs that are new males and new queens. The males and queens will emerge, they will go out and they will mate. Uh, and then the current colony, when fall and winter comes, the current colony will die. That colony is done. But those newly mated queens will then hibernate and the cycle will repeat itself year after year. And so knowing our bee life cycles will help us support uh, bees in, in our backyards because we know what to look for and where they need to nest. But we'll come back to that. In the meantime, um, I hope you all get out and enjoy watching flower visitors, insects visiting your flowers this summer. And I want to give you a quick ID lesson. So bees, flies, and wasps look very, very similar. So here's your pop quiz. So take a look at each photo and decide, am I a bee, a fly, or a wasp? And think to yourself real quick. I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, here is your answer key. So the first five photos are actually flies. Now flies mimic bees and wasps because bees and wasps are stinging insects. And if a fly can mimic a stinging insect, then predators will leave them alone, humans included. So these, um, oh, sorry, these five photos are flies. And then down here we have a wasp and here we have a couple of bees. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about key characteristics to look for. So wasps, wasps have long, narrow bodies, and they don't have hairs on their bodies or very few hairs. So they also have a constriction. It looks like someone went and pinched their abdomen. Uh, oftentimes that's, that's very pronounced in wasps. They have long, curly antennae, and they don't carry pollen like bees do. And here's how you tell a fly versus a bee. So flies have, we call them fly eyes. They have huge giant eyes that go to the top of their head. Uh, where bees and wasps, their eyes are on the sides of their head. Flies also have short stubby antenna. So you won't see, if you see long antenna, you know it is not a fly. Um, and then they also have one, only one pair of wings. Uh, which can sometimes be hard to view um, when they're visiting flowers. Most flies don't have hairs, but there are exceptions, and flies do not carry pollen. So bees, now bees are all variety of shapes, sizes, and colors, but things you can look for. So most of the time bees are going to have hair on their bodies, on their head, their thorax, and their abdomen. Bees are also going to carry pollen. Uh, they're going to carry pollen one of two ways. They have pollen baskets on their hind legs. So you'll see a, a round ball of pollen and nectar on honeybees and bumblebees. All other bees have special pollen collecting hairs, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. Um, bees also have long antenna, but they often have a bend in them where wasps and flies do not have that. So let's go back to our, our photos here. Look at these fly eyes in the first five photos. See those giant eyes um, that go, you know, pretty much to the top of their head. And you also, they have short stubby antenna. Wasps, this is a sand wasp uh, that you'll see foraging for nectar sometimes. Might look a little scary, but they are totally harmless um, unless you like try to pick it up or anything, or, you know, something, and then you, you could get stung. Um, but long, narrow bodies, long, narrow wings over their bodies, uh, and no pollen or anything like that. Now this right here is a bee. It kind of looks like a wasp, but notice she's got hairs on her bodies. She's got a bend in her antenna, and it's a little hard to see in this picture, but she has special pollen collecting hairs on the underside of her abdomen. And then this picture right here is sort of a trick question. This is a bee that looks like a wasp. And that's because it's called a cuckoo bee. Cuckoo bee are parasitic bees that will actually outcompete uh, their, their native bee host. So just like the cuckoo bird, a cuckoo bee will lay her eggs in another bee's nest and those eggs will outcompete the host bee. So this really dives into to bee identification, which we don't have time to go into today, 
But I just wanted to give you an idea of the diversity of insects that we have. And here's some more pictures of bees that are found in Colorado. So this top left corner, this little bee is in a bindweed flower. And so she's very tiny. She's got special pollen collecting hairs on her hind legs right here. All the way, so tiny little bees, all the way to queen bumblebees that can be upwards of about one inch long. Here right, we have a, a sunflower bee. She's got really thick pollen collecting hairs on her hind legs. So when you see her on a cone flower, for instance, her legs are probably gonna be bright yellow. It'll look like she's wearing leg warmers. So when you're observing insects visiting your flowers, look at how they're carrying pollen. Look and see if it's a bee or a fly or a wasp. So let's talk about safety and stings. And these next few slides, I get so many questions on, I decided to add this to, to the pollinator contents because um, I do think it's really important for, for everyone to understand. So everyone says, ow, I was stung by a bee. Well, in all reality, you were probably stung by a Western yellow jacket wasp. So 90% of stings are actually yellow jackets. Um, and they can sting you over and over again too if they feel provoked. Um, so honeybees, on the other hand, don't want to sting you. They will die after they sting you. So stinging is really their last resort. Um, so they have to be provoked or really stepped on um, to be able, you know, if they're gonna sting you. So native bees and our solitary wasps, they cannot or very rarely sting. So our native bees and solitary wasps, you would really have to like pick them up to get stung or you, they would have to be pressed up against your skin to get stung. Um, they, they avoid humans, they don't want anything to do with us and are a very low risk for stings. So when we think about creating pollinator habitat and planting pollen or planting flowers, um, the increase for stings is actually very minimal because planting flowers does not increase your yellow jacket population. Yellow jackets feed on human food sources and uh, meat sources like, like carrion. So planting pollinator habitat, um, very low risk. The only thing you might want to keep in mind is if, you know, if you have children and um, playgrounds and, you know, you may want to plant them far away, you know, from where kids are playing, for instance. Okay, so since we brought yellow jackets up, let's talk about them a little bit because they are a nuisance and bees often get all the blame for yellow jackets. So yellow jackets, they are a native insect. They are scavengers. So they, they are feeding on those, those dead meat sources and they, they are very attracted to human food sources. Picnics, barbecues, trash cans are, are perfect for attracting yellow jackets. And so they become a nuisance. Um, they nest underground, so the nests are hard to find. And if you happen to come across a nest, be very careful because uh, if they feel their nest is threatened, they may become very aggressive. So if you come across a nest and it is close to too close to human activity, you might actually consider calling a professional um, because if you try to put wasp spray or anything in that nest, their nest is underground and protected. So, so just be very aware of that. Um, one thing you can do, though, is purchase those yellow tube yellow jacket traps. Those are very effective, and I recommend putting them out now because yellow jackets have a one-year life cycle, and those queens are just emerging from hibernation now. So if you put the traps out now, you may capture the queens versus you wait till July. Well, she already has a couple hundred individuals in her colony. Um, you know, there's a lot more yellow jackets at that point. And then we have the European paper wasp. This is another wasp that gets blamed, you know, on bees a lot. Um, paper wasps are, this insect is a non-native insect uh, and they're, they have a very strong populations, especially in urban areas. They're gonna build these papery nests under house eaves, in your garden shed, any dark protected location that they can find. These wasps are actually not very aggressive. So you might see them flying around and you generally don't have to worry unless they feel their nest is threatened. And if their nest is close to human activity, the chance of stings could uh, increase. So um, another thing to note is they feed on caterpillars. So they are not gonna be around your barbecue or anything like that. They are after those soft bodied caterpillars. 
So there are options for nest removal. If you choose to use wasp sprays or anything like that, be sure to follow the label. The label is the law and you certainly don't want, you know, pesticide drift or anything like that. Um, paper wasps also have a one year life cycle. So once fall and winter comes, the col current colony will die and it'll only be the new, new mated queens that will hibernate over winter. So they never return to the same nest twice. And then we have a vast diversity of solitary wasps. And this is a whole nother presentation, um, but we like our, our solitary wasps. They feed on pest insects like crickets and soft-bodied caterpillars and flies. We need our solitary wasps and we often don't see them or notice them, but they have a very important role in, in our ecosystem. So here's some of the diversity. These were photos I've taken in my garden uh, over the last couple of years. And we love our bee hotels, but occasionally you might have a solitary nesting wasp in your bee hotel. No need to panic. These wasps are not aggressive. Again, they would have to be really pressed up against your skin or you would have to pick them up to get stung by one. Uh, and, and really they're, they're doing us a service in our garden. So if you find a solitary wasp in your bee hotel, I suggest watch it and observe because um, it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating life cycle. Um, some of these wasps will hunt spiders, um, crickets and caterpillars. Okay, so let's talk about uh, one way that people will support honeybees and that is beekeeping. So a lot of people say, you know, I want to support the bees. How do I become a beekeeper? Well, let's talk about that. And, and that way you can decide if beekeeping is the right decision for you. So kind of a fun fact, it takes 12 bees their entire lives to make one teaspoon of honey. Those are hardworking bees for that one teaspoon of honey. So make sure you appreciate your honey a little bit more. Um, beekeeping can be a very rewarding and educational uh, experience. They, honeybees provide us a lot of pollination services. They pollinate crops um, and they pollinate a lot of our crops very efficiently. But beekeeping is a time commitment. Uh, right now it's springtime, so beekeepers are feeding their bees a sugar syrup to help support them while, you know, because there aren't too many flowers that are blooming yet. And so, you know, my, my bees last summer went, or last spring, went through a gallon of sugar syrup every four days. So we were in the hive about every four days feeding them sugar syrup. Um, and you also have to do hive inspections and mite checks and mite treatments. Um, so, so it is a hefty time commitment. Uh, and it can be upwards of anywhere from $500 to $1,000 just to get started. Some of those, it's a one-time cost, um, but if you lose your bees or anything, you know, there will be reoccurring costs. Um, there's a chance of stings when you're a beekeeper and beekeeping is just plain hard, um, especially in Colorado. We have extreme temperature fluctuations and honeybees also have pests and diseases that, that make it hard to, to beekeep. So if you're interested in exploring beekeeping, uh, check your local ordinances, um, be a good neighbor and educate your neighbors. Um, provide a water source. One of the most common questions I get about bees is, I have a hot tub and there's all these bees drinking water out of my hot tub. What's up? And that's probably because their neighbors have a beehive and their hot tub is the closest water source. So provide water for your bees um, and do research because uh, beekeeping is a, there's a lot to learn. Uh, and it, there is a learning curve. So find a mentor, join a club, um, do a lot of reading and research. And can you just set up a hive and let it be? Well, honeybees are a non-native species. So we manage them. Um, so we cannot set it up and let, let it be because otherwise um, the, you know, the varroa mites are, are likely gonna take over is, is the biggest challenge. So they do require ongoing maintenance. And, and if you don't keep up with that maintenance, you're actually harming other hives around you because those pests and diseases will spread. Uh, and you know, beekeeping is tough. Even if you're the best beekeeper, colony losses still range from 30 to 60% every year. So, so it's tough, it's hard to lose your bees. Uh, and you know, really part of beekeeping now is mite keeping. You have to keep those mites at bay. 
which require you to do monthly mite checks and treatments as needed. Um, yeah, so, and bee swarms. So just a, a quick note about bee swarms because swarm season is starting. Beekeepers will, or I'm sorry, bees will swarm when they outgrow their hive. Beekeepers don't want to lose their bees. So there's precautions they can take to prevent that from happening. Uh, but if you come across a bee swarm, a couple things to keep in mind. Those honeybees gorged on honey as much as they could before they left. They grabbed the queen and they are off in search of a new home. Because they're so full of honey and they don't have a home to protect, swarms are very docile. Um, you, you know, this photo is a picture I took. Um, it's about the size of a football. I went right up there, you know, and got some great pictures. They're very docile. They are only going to sting if you provoke them. So when you see a swarm, don't panic. Um, call the bee swarm hotline because there's a long list of beekeepers that's, that want uh, those bees. So is beekeeping the best way to save the bees? No. So an analogy that's often used is beekeeping to save the bees is the same as raising chickens to save the birds. So because honeybees are a domesticated species, um, really if you want to support all bee populations, the best way is to provide habitat for them. Uh, so really you, you beekeep to, for, the, for the hobby, for, for the experience. Um, otherwise, you know, the best way to support all our local pollinator populations is to provide habitat. So how do you decide? I would look at the goals for, for your landscape. Um, do you want honey? Do you want to spend the time and money beekeeping? Um, if so, maybe that's a good direction for you. If you want to support all the pollinators, the native bees, butterflies, um, and other, other pollinators, your best bet is going to be to provide habitat spaces for them in your landscape. So let's transition right into pollinator habitats. Um, I'm going to answer a couple of quick questions. Um, so yellow jacket traps don't hurt the bees? Correct. Yellow jacket traps have a, a pheromone that only attracts yellow jackets. They do not attract paper wasps and they do not attract any bees. You might see a honeybee flying around because they are attracted to the color yellow, but they, they will not enter the trap. They, they don't, they are not attracted to that scent. Um, how do you find a local bee club? Um, the Colorado State Beekeepers Association. Um, I, I would type that into Google. Their website will come up and they have a list of all the bee clubs in Colorado. Uh, you can also Google, you know, Denver Bee Club, for instance, um, and hornets. So hornets are a specific type of wasp. And a lot of hornets, uh, you know, they, they aren't necessarily a nuisance wasp. They will build papery nests in, high in the trees and will really only be a threat if their nest is threatened. Uh, so, so again, they, they can sting, they're, they're a social insect. Um, but most of the time, they're actually not a problem for, for humans anyway. Okay, pollinator habitats. So one of the big things you can do, they need food, shelter, and space, just like we do. Uh, and we can provide food for them. So a couple things to keep in mind, they need a diversity of blooms. Um, each plant has a different nutritional profile. So diversity is the spice of life. Uh, plant lots of different types of flowers. Uh, you want blooms all season, starting now, you know, where when the honeybees are active and, and the native bees are just starting to emerge all the way through October and sometimes even November, rabbit brush and goldenrod, you know, some of those late blooming uh, pollinator friendly plants are, are very important. Avoid double flowers. The, this, is, this is key. So horticulturalists and, and plant propagators they breed plants to be big, bright, beautiful, and to be low maintenance. So in that process, they actually, they breed out the plant reproductive parts inside the flower. So what you get is a big, lovely flower for the landscape, but it doesn't offer any pollinator, for, it doesn't have pollen and nectar, it doesn't offer the, the bees or butterflies anything. So what you wanna look for um, is look inside the flower, look for that pollen, Look for those plants reproductive parts. Um, if you see a big showy flower like this, there, it might be a sterile plant. Um, you'll you'll want to look inside. 
if you're at an outdoor garden center, look and see where the bees are going to. Um, that, that can be another, another way. Um, all kinds of flowers can be double flowers. And, and roses is one example. You have double flower roses that don't provide anything for pollinators. You have a whole wide variety of roses that offer a lot of great pollen and pollen and nectar for bees. And then you have native varieties of roses too that uh, offer a great resource for our bees. So there's not, um, there's, there's not like a good list. Uh, so I'd recommend doing your research and looking inside those flowers and, and see where the bees are going to. There's also questions about native versus horticultural varieties. Here's what I'll say about that. Um, native flowers are awesome. They're, they're great for pollinators. They're often low water, which is great for your landscape. Um, they, they offer a variety of benefits. We know that for a fact. Horticultural varieties, there's a lot of great horticultural varieties that are great for bees too. Uh, we don't know if they offer you know, the, the exact same benefits as native plants, but a lot of them do probably, and a lot of them don't. So, so again, it's gonna be um, a little bit of research uh, to, to find um, the perfect plants for your landscape. Here's another example of a double flower. That little bumblebee, she's gonna be so sad. There's nothing for her inside. Um, this top photo is a Rocky Mountain penstemon, a, a native plant. Um, there's a little green sweat bee sitting inside there. Okay, so then we have plants pollinator syndromes. Now these are general guidelines you can use depending on the type of pollinator that you want to attract. So for instance, bees are attracted to bright white, yellow, blue, and purple flowers. Now again, double flowers aren't gonna count. Uh, so, but, but generally speaking, uh, the, these can be useful guidelines. Birds are gonna be attracted to scarlet and orange and red colored flowers like um, scarlet gilia is a, is a great native plant or hyssop can, uh, can uh, be good for hummingbirds. Butterflies, like bright colored flowers, including red and purple. And they usually need a landing pad, uh, you know, a place to land on the flowers that they visit. And moths and bats are nocturnal, so they're gonna go to white and pale colored flowers that open up at night. And so what do bees see? Do they see the same colors that we do? Short answer is they do not. They actually see um, colors on the UV spectrum. So a couple of examples, here's uh, what we see to a human and here's what the bee sees. So a green grassy area actually appears gray to a bee. So not attractive, not attractive to the bee. And so here's a couple of plant lists. Um, I will caveat with this, with, these are some of my favorites that I like. There are so many other options. So um, I'm gonna send out a resource sheet after that will have links to a great native plants to grow in Colorado and, and other great plants to grow in Colorado. Um, but here, here's some example. So Rocky Mountain bee plants is, um, I'll just highlight that one. Uh, that is actually not a perennial. It, it's an annual that reseeds every year. Uh, will attract so many different types of, of bees from little tiny bees all the way to, to honeybees and sometimes bumblebees. Here are some plant select plants that are great for pollinators. If you're not familiar with plant select, they are a organization of uh, between CSU and the Denver Botanic Gardens. And they do research and they breed plants that will grow well in a Colorado landscape. Some of them are native, some of them are not native, but well adapted and well, you know, perfect for our climate. So again, there's a whole wide variety of, of plants that are uh, great for pollinators. Um, all the penstemon for varieties, for instance, um, Cape forget-me-nots and summer forget-me-nots, those will have bees all over them. All of those will actually. And then there's other pollinator friendly plants too. So a couple of my favorites, um, non-native favorites are blue mist spirea. That's a shrub that will just be covered in bees and it's a beautiful uh, purple, purple flowers. It's, it's a great addition to your landscape. Um, and there's a variety of trees that will, that are good for pollinators too. 
Um, if you have Japanese beetles in your area, I would avoid planting linden trees because the Japanese beetles love lindens. Um, and then another one that's not on here is moon carrot. Moon carrot uh, is actually a plant select variety and that will attract not only bees and pollinators, but other beneficial insects because there, there's so much nectar in those flowers. So when we think about what a landscape should look like that benefits pollinators, these green grassy landscapes, they're, they're lovely and they're well manicured, but they do not offer any services for pollinators. This middle photo is a little bit better. Uh, you've got, you know, your, your turf grass lawn, which may be great for your dogs or your kids, uh, but then you've got pockets of, of pollinator friendly flowers. And then this photo on the right is a, is a native uh, landscape low water garden. Um, this is pollinator paradise. Um, these are all pollinator friendly flowers, uh, low water, and are, are just as beautiful uh, in your landscape. Other things you can do for bees, they need shelter spaces. So we can provide bare soil areas for bees. I'm gonna check my time, okay. Uh, bare soil area for bees. So mulch is, uh, has a lot of benefits in our landscape. And I'm, I don't wanna discourage you from using mulch um, because it has so many other benefits, um, but maybe you use mulch in some areas, but maybe leave some bare soil areas too. And you can be very artistic about it um, and very intentional. Um, consider reducing lawn areas. So lawns have a, they have a great place for, you know, picnics and if you have kids and dogs and, and, you know, turf grass lawns can be very functional. But if you're not using those spaces to, to play on or to recreate on, maybe consider removing some of the turf and planting pollinator friendly plants instead. Um, can, that can be a great way to, to beautify your landscape as well. Uh, wildscaping is, is a term that go, moves towards the more messy, you know, less manicured and a little more messy like what you would find in nature. Um, that, can, that can be a great option. Uh, a lot of plants have hollow stems. So when you're considering cleaning up your, your landscape at the end of the year, if you notice you have some plants with hollow stems, raspberries, for instance, uh, would be a great example. Uh, maybe, maybe keep those throughout the winter because cavity nesting bees um, love to nest in those. Or you can even break the stem and open it up, uh, you know, dur during the summertime, if you, once they're done flowering and once they're done blooming, because um, if they can have an easy entrance into those cavities, uh, they, they may nest in there. And also provide a water source. All, all critters need a water source. So you can um, put out bird baths or shallow dishes with river rocks in them, provide perfect landing spaces for pollinators to drink water. Butterflies, uh, you know, they really need those caterpillar host plants. And I, I want to make a pitch for, for this butterfly right here. This is the two-tailed swallowtail. One of the most common butterflies, the big yellow butterflies we see, especially in our urban areas. Well, they host on ash trees, ash trees and choke, cher choke cherries. Uh, and if, if you're familiar with the emerald ash borer, over, over time, you know, we're, we're not going to have as many ash trees available uh, because of the emerald ash borer. So maybe consider planting a choke cherry. Choke cherries are native, uh, they're beautiful, and uh, provide wildlife too, uh, a food source, in addition to being a host plant for, for the two-tailed swallowtail. Uh, butterflies, they like sunny open areas, but they also need places to shelter from the wind. So having a wide variety, again, of flowers, of shrubs, of trees, um, places that they can rest. And here's a quick side note. Um, I, you know, each, each butterfly has its own host plant. And we had a, last year was a great year for the variegated fritillary butterflies, these orange butterflies right here. Well, I got a call at the extension office and someone, you know, these caterpillars were munching on the pansies and petunias in this person's landscape and, and they did not want them. So I asked him, I was like, can I have your caterpillars? <laughs> because I knew they were the, the variegated fertility. So we, he gave me the caterpillars and I bought some pansies for them, put them in a butterfly house, um, buy them on Amazon. And they had this beautiful metallic cocoon. Uh, and then they emerged and I released them afterwards. So 
Uh, you know, everything's about a matter of perspective. Um, I certainly didn't mind sacrificing a few pansies uh, for, for these butterflies, but you know, flowers are expensive too. So, so it's all a matter of perspective. Uh, hummingbirds need, again, that red orange water. They also need a variety of trees and shrubs to, to shelter and nest in. And you may see them visit um, shallow water dishes as well. Um, and then hummingbird feeders are, are a great way to attract hummingbirds. Bee hotels. Um, so I'm running short on time. So I'm not gonna dive into too deep here. What I will say is, is there's some basic requirements for bee hotels, like to have a back at the, at the end of the bee hotel. Um, it can't be just an open tube. Um, tubes need to be at least six inches long because otherwise the female is going to lay a disproportionate number of male and female eggs. Um, so, so there's some basic requirements, no plastic straws. Uh, there, there are uh, some great university extension fact sheets that we'll email out that provides, you know, the basics of, of how to make a bee hotel. Uh, but you can be very creative and very artistic. This, this is one uh, here in Littleton. And, and the other caveat to that is just like anything else, bee hotels do need maintenance, easy maintenance. You know, they're, they're it's not hard, uh, but you do have to replace them every year. Um, if you have tubes, you need to replace the tubes. If you use a wood block, you do need to replace the wood block. Because what we're finding is, you know, bee hotels over time will harbor fungus, mold, pathogens, pollen mites, and then that does the bees more harm than good. So this is a great fact sheet here in the right corner um, from Michigan State University. Outlines everything you need to know about bee hotels. Here's a couple of bee hotels that I made uh, for this spring. Uh, different types of bees will nest in different diameter holes. So, so keep that mind in mind as well. And if you do have bee hotels, you may attract a leaf cutter bees which uh, are the females will cut out a circle shaped leaf and they, she rolls it up and she carries it back to her nest. I actually have a leaf cutter bee nesting in between patio stones right now. And it was so much fun to watch her go back and forth um, with her leaf pieces. Keep in mind, they are not damaging your plants with this. It is purely aesthetics only. Uh, and so you don't have to worry. Uh, leaf cutter bee damage is often confused with root weevil damage. Notice how these are notches, not round holes. So if you have questions about that, call your local extension office. We'd be happy to help assist you with that. Um, if you're interested in learning more about uh, just wildlife and pollinator friendly maintenance, my colleague um, who's the HORT agent in Douglas, or I'm sorry, Boulder County, um, she and her team are working on habitat friendly maintenance guidelines. So easy steps that HOAs, that cities, that homeowners can take to, um, to reduce the impacts on pollinators. So things like waiting to prune your shrubs until after they flower or after you know, bird nesting season. Little tips like that that are, people don't often know about them but can go a long way into, into increasing uh, the space to be more habitat friendly. And I wanna make a pitch for my citizen science program out of CSU Extension. Uh, we train you to identify um, bees and, and differentiate them from flies and wasps. And you can observe flowers in your backyard and record the data and, and submit it. So we'll be doing trainings in late May. Um, you can volunteer as little or as often as you would like. Um, we would love to have your, your input. So here's the website for more information. Again, we'll send this out. Um, trainings will be in late May and we would love to have you contribute to this statewide database that we are building. And if you wanna keep learning, here's some of the resources that will be sent out afterwards. Um, some great CSU extension fact sheets. And also this is the citizen science field guide on bees. So even if you choose not to participate in the citizen science program, this is a, a publication you can download and I'll teach you a lot about our native bees. Here are a couple of my favorite books. Um, bees in Your Backyard uh, tells you, oh, so much, just a wealth of information on our native bees. And then this is a great book, Attracting Native Pollinators for, for Creating Habitats. We are Colorado State University Extension. If you're not familiar with us, we have an office in almost every county. And so in terms of horticultural services, we offer diagnostics, 
do you have a sick tree? Is your lawn dry? Do you have gardening questions? Um, do you have a weird bug in your house that you need identified? Call your local extension office. That's what we're here. We're a science-based resource in your community. And, and our job is to get the information out. We offer a wide variety of programs and public, or yeah, programs, presentations and, and publications. So visit our website and we actually offer a lot of gardening, free gardening webinars too. So um, here's, uh, I'm not sure what happened to my presentation, but we'll share that link with you. And um, thank you all so much for coming. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Lisa. There are so many amazing resources out there. I highly, highly recommend checking all of the ones that we send out afterwards. And thank you, Lisa, for such an informative and awesome presentation. I learned that I thought every fly was a bee. So that's good for me to learn uh, about that as well. There was one particular question that I thought maybe other people were also curious about uh, was what are hornets and how are they different? So hornets are a type of wasp. So again, we have literally thousands of species of wasps uh, in, in our ecosystems. So hornets are a type of wasp. Um, the, the type of hornet that is most common in Colorado, but actually not super common, is the bald-faced hornet. And so they make uh, the, the very iconic that you see in cartoons, like the, the paper tube nests, uh, and they're going to put those high in trees. So generally, if you have one in your tree, you actually, you can leave it there um, unless, you know, you have a, someone's climbing your tree and, and could threaten that nest. So they really aren't um, a threat or anything, and they, they typically aren't a nuisance either. So hornets are a type of wasp. Now, if there are no other major questions, should I address the Asian giant hornet, the, the murder hornets? Would that be good? Sure, that sounds awesome. Okay, I'm to actually going to share my screen because I anticipate this question and <laughs> um, I think it's important for people to know. So I think PowerPoint just shut down on me. Um, while I load this up, so the Asian giant hornet was all over the news last summer and it was very um, sensational news as well. Uh, and so what you need to know Let's see here. Let me just do this real quick. What you need to know, a small number of wasps were found in Washington, Northeast Washington, uh, and the entomologists there are doing their best to eradicate all the individuals. So hopefully that will be successful, uh, but the Asian giant hornet is not in Colorado and it is not coming to Colorado either. Uh, the Asian giant hornet, um, they cannot survive in our climate. We are too dry. Uh, they need a much more humid climate and they also don't have a very good way of getting here either. Some insects, some invasive species travel well, uh, let, like the emerald ash borer travels well in firewood. Um, this is not one of those insects that would travel well to Colorado. Um, and it wouldn't get here on its own because it would literally have to fly over the Rocky Mountains to get here. So no worries. Um, what is really unfortunate that happened last summer is a lot of our native wasps, out of, out of fear, uh, a lot of our native wasps were killed in fear of that it's the Asian giant hornet. And this wasp right here was the victim. Now this wasp, it, it is large and it looks scary, but it cannot sting you if it tried. Like it physically, like you could pick it up and it will not sting you. And that's because this what looks like a stinger is called an ovipositor. It's used to lay eggs and it's specialized to drill uh, into the bark of trees and she lays her eggs in trees. She doesn't harm trees. Uh, she, she only lays her eggs in trees that are already dying or dead. So, so this wasp is literally harmless, but everyone was in their gardens last summer. We got hundreds of questions, extension as a whole, hundreds of questions on these wasps. So if you're lucky enough to observe one, don't worry, it's not the Asian giant hornets. They are not in Colorado um, and enjoy you know, the, the native wasps that you have. The other thing about the Asian giant hornet that got a lot of attention is that they would decimate a, you know, the honeybee populations. And Asian giant hornets, like so many other insects, are opportunistic hunters. 
So if there happened to be a colony of Asian giant hornets, you know, very close to, to honeybee hives, yes, they, they would probably do a lot of damage. However, they don't seek out honeybees. They, they will hunt whatever insects are um, easiest to, to catch in their area, just like the praying mantis. Everybody loves the praying mantis. Well, the praying mantis is, will hunt anything and everything uh, that it can. So um, good to keep perspective when, when you're thinking about the Asian giant hornet. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions. I definitely remember seeing the headlines about that last summer. So sad that some of the native uh, wasps were harmed in that frenzy, but I appreciate the information so much, Lisa. Uh, and do you have any parting words before we close off our wonderful event today? Well, I would say get outside this summer and just observe the, the wonderful insect biodiversity that we have in our gardens. They offer so much to us or, you know, so many services to us and, and we, we barely notice that they're there. So observe this summer and call your local extension office um, with any questions that you might have. Uh, I'll put up my email address too, so you all have that. Awesome. Thank you so, so much, Lisa. Truly appreciate your time and expertise with us today. Uh, and thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you to our series sponsor, Fossil Creek Nursery, our event sponsor, uh, Outpost Sunsport. And truly to all of you, thank you again for being here. Stay safe, stay stalwart, go plant something green and go Rams. Take go care. Go Rams. Thanks again, Lisa. Thanks. Bye.